So welcome uh, to the second lightning talk session. I'm going to briefly explain how this session works for the audience and uh, the speakers. For all the speakers, please sit in one of the front rows so you can get on the stage quickly to deliver your talk. You can do so by talking into the microphone. That's very important so that people can hear you. Do not turn around to see your slides because then you can't, yeah, you can't hear me if, even if I talk. So uh, you can see your slides down on the screen here. Maybe it could be that you are too small, then uh, just move a bit to the side and you can see them. Use the clicker to advance the slides. Stay calm, talk loud and clearly so that everybody can hear your message. Finish on time, which is very important because we have so many talks and we don't want to use more time than we are allowed to. Then get your applause and leave the stage. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. But I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to leave yet. Um, I'm going to explain for the audience how to listen to lightning talks. So it's pretty simple. Just be excellent to each other. Keep in mind all the, announcement I just, all the announcements I just made. But also watch the timekeeper. The timekeeper is right up here, or you can see it on the screen up there, uh, which helps us to track the five minutes that every speaker has. Alex, would you take over? Yes, of course. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, with the last talk yesterday with Pedaloon, we uh, tried, uh, we decided to try a more speaker-friendly and more appreciative approach to cancelling a talk. You no more 54321R sounds, we want to laudate them out. So we try to use some applause to stop the talk. This is, I think, more awesome for the speakers and maybe for you as well. For the speakers, as long as the timekeeper is in the green area, you are in the first four minutes of your talk. You have plenty of time. When it goes up like this, now you have only about one minute left. When it starts turning yellow, you have one minute left. These are the last 30 se seconds of your talk when they start uh, to get red. So if the red turns up something like this, then you have not much time left. So, And we tried a new approach. Five, four, three, two, one. I think this might work. Actually. Yeah, I think so too. Because we noticed that most speakers are already on their contact slide and when we buzz them out, it's not very nice. So we just, yeah, send them away with an applause. <laughs> All right. Um, I think that's it. Uh, I, I'm going to mention the translation. So a very awesome job by the translation team. Please give them a huge round of applause. <laughs> we, we will have the German talks translated into English, the English talks translated into German, and also everything translated into French. Uh, see the website up there, so https c3lingo.org, for information on how to listen to these translated streams. Yeah, well, then I think we can start. Let's go with the first speaker. So, good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here so early. Uh, I'm here to tell you about uh, a little uh, project that I'm working on Saturday. Uh, I'm going to tell you it's a one-day conference that I'm organizing in Berlin next year, which is very soon. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the conference is about, which is the R programming language, a little bit how I ended up organizing a conference, and uh, why I think it's interesting to you. Maybe it's philosophy, which is open and open source. So let's get started. So R is uh, now one of the main languages for data science and statistical programming. Uh, it is a great tool for uh, data visualization as well. And it is free and open source. It's supported by the R Foundation, and uh, it is widely used. It just celebrated its 25th year this year, um, and is used uh, both in research and in industry. Uh, companies like Google, Airbnb, um, you can find it just about anywhere. And I'm Noah. I'm from Berlin. 
And how did I end up dedicating uh, all of my free time, um, some of my best friends' free time, some of their colleagues, and some of people uh, I just met through Twitter because I announced it a few weeks ago. Um, so it started with Our Ladies. I've been organizing an Our Ladies meetup in Berlin for the past two years. And Our Ladies uh, is an effort by, again, the R uh, um, community to try to promote uh, um, women's involvement in our uh, code, to get more women to contribute to code and to be active and to feel like R is a language that, and a community that is for them. And we do that by offering meetups and mentorship programs. And uh, I've been really, I think it's some of, it's like my side project and it's still some of my best work, I think, over the last two years. And along that, I also started volunteering. So it looks a little bit like this. I think it's really fun. And if you are interested in R, I highly recommend. It's open for everyone. Uh, only the organizational roles are reserved for women. And uh, a Along, uh, around that time, a bit later, I also started uh, volunteering at Forwards, which is the task force by the uh, R Foundation to promote all sorts of diversity and inclusion, not just uh, for women. So it's for LGBTQ+, uh, it's for people with disabilities, it's for different minority groups, and we're really trying to do all sorts of work around that. Um, and this year, I had the opportunity to get for the first time outside of my local bubble. So other than Slack and GitHub, uh, I've only known our users uh, around me and in maybe a few data science conferences. Um, so I went to the European R user, uh, our user meetup uh, in Budapest this year. And they actually, uh, two years before that, in 2016, organized the first Saturday event uh, at Budapest. And I was really inspired by their vibrant community and by meeting a lot of people that I only knew through Slack and GitHub thus far, and a lot of sub-communities that are not location-based uh, in the Our Ladies and Our Community. And I really thought, well, if, if you can do this in Budapest, why can't you do it in Berlin? I'm sure we have enough people who use R um, to create a similar um, conference. So I thought, why not? Uh, let's organize Saturday, signed up on GitHub, and that, that's how I ended up doing that. So why did I like so much the idea of it? So it very much relates to my history with Our Ladies and Forwards. It's the philosophy behind Saturday. So it's not let's just have another conference for R. And it's not let's just have another event for people to come and share idea. It's really about let's make sure that as many people as possible can come and share idea, ideas. Um, so how do we do that? We make sure that it's completely volunteer run. Um, we are not for profit and if we will have any leftover money we reinvest it into scholarships for the community or events like bringing speakers and so on. Um, uh, it's low cost, we cap it at a minimum wage um, and uh, we try to make sure it's both for beginners and for advanced users and we really make a lot of efforts to include women, minorities, um, LGBTQ uh, and uh, people with disabilities. How do we do that? So we don't need to invent the wheel, thankfully, and this might be the interesting part for you. There are a lot of resources about how to make sure that your events and your communities um, are um, suitable for uh, uh, as many people as possible and that uh, you can use DISC. Um, by a num focus group. You can use the great resources from uh, other conferences. And I guess that's it. Um, this is our organizing team. Uh, if you're interested in more information, and if you want to help us out, then please Five, be in touch. Four, three. <laughs> Thank you. Next up is uh, science sector or public sector information directive. Yeah, good morning, Leipzig. Hold on one second. So I will talk about the fancy topic of uh, public sector information. And in case anybody wonders what it is, that's basically the open data legislative uh, for whole Europe, which is at the moment right now negotiated uh, in the coming weeks in Brussels. And what does that do at the Congress? Uh, well, basically, ideally, uh, from the uh, hacker ethics, uh, öffentliche Daten nützen, private schützen, or use public data, protect private data, is like one of the core fundamentals. And I'm working at the Open Knowledge Foundation, so we do a lot of like open data stuff, like uh, Frag den Staat, Offene Gesetze, which was recently launched, and Jugendhack, the Code for Germany, OGP, or EIDI. 
And so what is open data, in case nobody knows it, it's basically data you can freely use, modify, or share by anyone for any purpose, meaning also you can make a business out of it. And uh, this, what you see here, that part is right now negotiated. That's also like open data or data which should be open data held by like uh, public institutions or government-owned uh, enterprises. And uh, to, that's the list what we are demanding. And to keep it short, basically everything which is funded by public money should be also public good. Or in Germany, there's a campaign by Wikimedia which is called Ök Ök, Öffentliches Gut, uh, Öffentliches Geld. And the other way around. So that's the standing. Uh, in December, there was an ITRE Ausschuss, uh, the voting and right now the negotiation. And why this is important? Because also like in Germany, in this legislative period, we should get a new open data law. At least that's like in the coalition contract. And I want to illustrate that why that is important on one example, and that is like public transportation data, which is like right now a really bad, sad affair in Germany. And why is that important? Because, for example, we want to have increased mobility, less CO2, and uh, it's a big sector. So that's the current state. Where it's green, we have open data in the transportation sector. Here we are in Leipzig, and everything else is like not compatible with 2018. I would say, and when you're missing data, you get like some weird routing issue shit, uh, like what you can see here. And that goes around all over Europe. So by the end of the day, or like in the long run, we first have a human being on the Mars before we have like public open data in the transportation sector. And we want to change that. And there's actually hope. So when we use open standards, open software, open data, there's a great example coming from Finland, which they created this platform just for Helsinki, but it was open. So it was uh, modifiable for anybody else. So there's like Meran, which is a tiny town in Italy, adapted that model like for just 15,000 euros. And you have like, a life map where the buses are going. And that was done by one developer because Helsinki was so awesome providing the platform as open source and there was data standards. So what that means basically, you can move from like uh, data shoveling by your hand to like industrial rollout. And that means like efficiency, it's like just awesome when you think about what could be done all across Europe when we have standards. And that's the directive should be there for it. And it's not just like this case, transportation, it's also like for transparency when it comes to uh, beneficial ownership of companies or for example what pro public broadcasting stations are doing that you can see the content uh, and use it later. So that's a detailed list, I don't know how much time we have. Basically what you should think about it, how awesome it would be if a deal like public uh, data as an infrastructure and what can be done with it. And so please bug your local uh, politicians or whoever is in charge of it on local level and if you're interested, uh, contact us. The slides are online, they're linked because it's, I think, a little bit timely. And I think that was from my side, so we still have time for a QA. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any quick questions right now? Yeah. I don't see any hands. But we're always happy if we are a bit short on time because, uh, yeah. It was my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Already. Next up is password strength meters. Okay. Good morning. Um, we are talk, uh, here to talk about uh, passwords, and uh, it's it's 2018, and we can say that passwords are, are here to stay, and we're going to see them for a long time now. And we also can admit that passwords actually can be quite good considering it's like a knowledge-based uh, single-factor authentication mechanism. But passwords are only quite good if we select suitable passwords. And that brings us to the topic on how do we actually measure the strength of passwords. This is a big topic. Uh, it's called uh, password strength meters. There are a lot of them out there, actually. Uh, there has been some progress in the hacking community, in the academic community. Uh, but there's still a lot of debate of uh, what strength meter is actually good and what is uh, to be considered good. Uh, I have two examples at the bottom. On the left-hand side, you can see uh, GitHub. And this is a password strength meter that starts out uh, with like a, a policy that is displayed in red. And uh, as you start typing, this policy is kind of validated. And if you match the policy, it's made green. Uh, on the right-hand side, we can see um, GMX. Uh, I uh, tried to create an account yesterday for emails. And um, I started typing a password, like one of the simplest ones I could make up, like one to eight, uh, the digits, and actually the meter made it quite green, which is uh, surprising that this is considered to be a strong password by GMX in 2018. Now, 
Um, we are trying to improve on that. So we are proposing a new password strength meter. Uh, we are planning to open source it like earlier next year. And it's a fuzzy logic based approach that combines multiple indicators for a password strength. So we can have like policy stuff in there, like length and so on. Uh, but we can also have like lists of leaked passwords. We can have Levenstein distance and further combinations. Uh, it's supposed to be really lightweight so that it can be integrated in every browser and every website. But uh, it's only an approach, and we have to make sure that it is really good. And this is where my colleague uh, Nikanta is going to ask for your help. Hi. Uh, so basically, there are a lot of things you can use in a password strength meter. But when we thought about ways to evaluate one, uh, we said, oh, we have a problem. You see, in, in science, um, a way to evaluate a hypothesis is to, to do an experiment. And that's why we need you. So we are launching the password hacker contest with a goal of uh, evaluating password strength by trying to break it. And we want to crowdsource your, your knowledge to, to help uh, build new, better strength meters. What we did is uh, we collected a list of human-generated passwords from people we trust, like our mothers, etc. so no unfair competition there. And this contains a mix of weaker and stronger passwords. We hashed them uh, with a SHA-512 and uh, with a common salt to reduce the overhead of expensive machinery for more hashing. And what we want from you is to, to work uh, in teams or alone, use your favorite tools, uh, do whatever you like, and try, try to break them. Uh, what we want at the end is uh, the, the plain text, which is the proof that the passwords were broken, and a short report saying uh, how you did it and which passwords were easier to break and which were more uh, difficult to break. Of course, we offer some amazing prizes, like um, Amazon gift cards, a lot of surprise swag like t-shirts, polo shirts, and so on. Uh, I think but WD500, which is the, the old IBM design, so you can also use it as a brick. Um, Nerf guns, um, um, and basically you can come uh, at our office and take a lot of stuff that we don't need anymore. Um, we, we ship freely um, in the whole of Germany, but we would really like to, to see you at our office in Darmstadt. Um, so what you can do now is go in, um, on this address, and there are instructions there. There's the first batch of hashes, and you can start hacking. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up would be Netlink and Go. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, today, I want to talk to you about Netlink and Go. Uh, my name is Florian, and I'm very interested in network stuff. And if you take a look at the web servers around the world, this is the kind of code you will see nowadays. It's basically, in this kind of example, a uh, Go uh, web server. This is just showing you a simple website. And uh, there's always a one big question if you're in a reliable service. Um, how many numbers of sessions do we have? How long are the durations of the sessions? And what about the number of um, amount of traffic that is transferred for your, um, on your web service? There are a couple solutions you can use. And um, you can blow up the code completely and make it really hard to understand at the, if you want to make sure that uh, the next person you hire can also understand the business logic of your web server, keep it simple, and to try to move the uh, monitoring part away. And there's one solution I can offer you. We at the, mo at the moment, we have the web server in the user space and the Unix kernel in the kernel space. And the kernel itself has a good, some kind of tracking of sessions. And why don't you use uh, this kind of, uh, kind of API so uh, you can use this for monitoring? Um, there's the so-called Netlink family. Uh, the Netlink family is a socket-based uh, interface for user uh, space processes to communicate with the internal kernel API. And you can get various um, information about um, different kind of stuff. In total, at the moment, there are 21 uh, uh, different sub uh, subgroups 
use for an, uh, that are based on a Netlink protocol. For example, there's Netlink Route, Netlink Crypto, where you can um, change crypto settings, in kernel crypto settings of your uh, computer. There's also um, Netlink X XFRM for IPsec stuff, um, SE Linux, and a lot of stuff. As I'm most interested in networking, um, I concentrate on uh, Netlink and Netfilter, and there are divided into three parts basically, NFLog, NFQ, and Contract. Maybe if you work with IP tables, you heard of them. And um, in Go, you can now basically use uh, this, bi uh, this binary-based protocol um, to directly communicate with the kernel, get information out there, get the number of sessions, how long they take, how long they last, and um, just use this information that's already there and don't, and don't have to blow up your own code. And it's completely in a separate way, so you don't have to blow up your, um, your web server, and it can be done in a quite easy way. Um, the byte stream that you get from the kernel via the socket is basically only a byte stream. Um, in difference to most byte streams, the combination is the length, type, and value, not the type, value, uh, type length, and value. So this is a little bit different to most protocols you maybe know. And, um, but it's basically all the same. So you just have to take a look at the length, check the type, and then you have the value. Value can be anything. It can be from byte sequences to strings, numbers, uh, integers, timestamps, everything what the kernel you can provide. And um, for conversation, Golang has a lot of features, so you don't have to make uh, sure. So for example, if you want to monitor your web application, this is a quite simple example. Uh, with IP tables, you send everything through NFLog group 100. Then you open the socket with NFLog open. Uh, in this example, I set a timeout for 30 seconds just to make sure that uh, this will stop at 30 seconds. Otherwise, it will run forever. And uh, then you can get all the uh, NFLog messages. So you have a quite good overview of what is happening on uh, your web server. And you don't have to change your web server uh, application. This also works for different kind of um, um, models. If you, for example, provide your web server in Java, if you do something like this, or PHP. So thank you for your attention. Um, the most information, most reliable information is the man page, number seven netlink. Um, you can try the GitHub repo or check out the Linux kernel source. If there are any questions, I'm around. Just ping me, I'm Florian, and um, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next up is uh, the food hacking base. I can. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Fratiček Algor Afplebek, and I would like to present the Furikin Base project. Uh, this year it's our, uh, I think, seventh congress when we are around. We have been starting with 27C3. Uh, it was very interesting for us to get involved and uh, during the years basically build up the community around the food, beer, and drinks. Uh, I have to say that the last Congress, 34C3, when we actually were inside, uh, compared to 33C3, when we could see us on a roof of the Hall H, uh, was much better. It was warmer. We had a warm water. We have a big place uh, where you could come and do stuff. I don't know how many of you have been actually visiting Foodback Game Hacking Base during the years. Can I just ask for the hands up who has popped in? Also, it's starting to get in. Um, we have been happy with the place, a uh, bit uh, tight at the end of the Congress, I have to say, when people finally found us, but this year it got better, we will go to that. Uh, small overview of the year, which we are just now finishing, uh, we have visited in the spring New Ligand, uh, this is the poster for the next year. We have found out as a project that actually when we are invited and uh, we get help, you know, kind of, you know, promoting project from the local host, it really kind of uh, make it possible to kind of cover the expenses of the event for us. 
via donation based groups so kind of you know what we put in we put in if you support us good if you don't well we have to basically cover it by ourselves we have been at fright cap in uh, belgium uh, which was a fairly uh, run event uh, where we didn't do actually crowdsourcing for a bigger kind of camp like that for us uh, which we have found out it's difficult after to cover so uh, experience another one uh, i don't know how many of you have been at the uh, emf it was my first one basically in uh, great britain it was very nice uh, we did a kitchen free environment because getting our stuff from europe to the uk was a bit complicated considering transportation but it worked quite fine so it's good now this year uh, we did the 35c3 that's uh, where i am you can find us in the hall 2 uh, between the door 2.6 2.7 as you can see this is already our first evening tasting and we are completely full uh, so we have been actually really nicely surprised with the amount of people who are showing up and also with the dynamic of the group because i have to say it's really maybe like you know one of the first events when we as a core group don't have to do so much and people are actually doing the stuff they just come and use the place which is nice and we just more as uh, you know keep an eye that you know things are magically appearing from the shops you know which you know has to be used so this is very nice now uh, we'll be finishing the congress i hope all goes well we hope to be a bit in a plus you know so we can actually fund our project for the next year which are again you know community kind of based you know and open uh, we would like to be at the camp of course uh, that will be coordinated with the orga where we again we will do our tasting events workshop events you know kombucha making beef jerky making incubators etc uh, we would like to uh, do fermentation project uh, fermentation mobile which i already presented uh, before uh, which is basically a, uh, you can imagine a food truck but play you know thing which is legalized and can go to the different events where we can really kind of you know do workshops and stuff on a kind of i would say higher protected level uh, so that is a project which I would like to lead uh, and with support of the Fuel King base. Otherwise, I believe uh, we are open to invitations. So if you talk to us, uh, just send us email, foodekingbase.org, you know, just you write foodekingbase, you will find us and you'll get a uh, response eventually, sooner or later. And we are interested to come to different happenings. We have been in MRMCD, we have been at the Balcon, we have been in the Newstein, so different events, we enjoy it. Uh, it's something what we like to do and promote. And we hope that more people get involved and uh, support uh, these activities also in their local hackerspaces. Because during the years, I have to say, and uh, it's my experience, it's my feel, that uh, taking care about yourself from the point of view of food, uh, drinks, a bit of exercise, it really helps, especially for most of you who are sitting most of the day behind the desk. Try to keep uh, a bit healthy in the side. It really makes your life more easy. I would like to thank all of you uh, for listening to what I have to say. Please come and visit us at the Fudekin base. And that's all. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you. Next up is Getaviz. Did I pronounce that correctly? Getaviz, Getaviz. I don't know. We'll see. Hello, I'm here to present Getaviz, <laughs> um, which is a resource. Pro uh, research project and open source project for solving software engineering problems in three simple steps, and these steps I'm going to present to you. So first step is we collect a lot of data about your software project. This can be a lot of things. Um, we use JQ Assistant for that. It provides a Neo4j graph database and with a lot of plugins where you can combine and link different data sources. Currently, uh, we support five different programming languages, uh, two version control systems, and many other data sources like GitHub issues, Maven build reports, JUnit test reports. And then, as a result, we have a huge database with a lot of information about the software project. And then, um, this is the data source for finding the solution to your problem. 
And to help this, we visualize the data. There are a lot of visualizations available. Um, there are classical dashboards with tree maps, bar charts, and all this classical stuff. And more fancy visualizations on the right side. And here, for example, you can see um, analysis for anti-pattern. This is Antler. Um, we find a lot of um, cyclic dependencies there, for example. And yeah, these vis visualizations um, are supposed to help you to understand your problem, which is the last step. Because, as you know, understanding the problem is almost the same as having the solution. Once you understand the problem, the rest is rather easy. And for this, we provide a complex user interface for exploring and analyzing the visualized data and get a better understanding of the software project in general. Um, that's the point where I usually would give you a live demo, which is not possible here, so you have to do it yourself. Um, that's the official project URL, or just go to bit.ly slash getawith. There you find some showcases and online demos you can um, use in the browser. Yeah, and that are the three steps. Um, give it a try if you are working with software in some way. And, but um, there's a fourth step. You can contribute to it. Um, currently, it's a small project with academic background, but we hope to um, build an open source community around it. So you can contribute to any programming language because we are going to extend it to support more data sources with JQ Assistant or more visualizations and a better user interface for GetAwith. And as in 2018, we are going to apply for Google Summer of Code next year, so in a month or so. So if you are a student, there's a chance you can even get paid for this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Next up is Zig Rock. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Sören, and I would like to introduce you to our SIGROC project. Um, as you can see on the table here, we try to support all kinds of devices, um, especially everything kinds of test and measurement related. You can see like multimeters, oscilloscope, logic analyzers, all kinds of stuff. Um, we currently support over 200 devices, and the question is how do we do that? If you look at the software stack of our project, you can see that um, the core component is libsigrog. It is um, a library that encapsulates all the drivers for all the devices we support and provides a unified API for all of them. So you can access them having only one API to deal with and uh, getting all the data from them. Below that, you see lib, uh, lib USB, lib serial port, lib FTDI1, and lib GPIB, uh, lib, uh, lib, uh, glib. And um, these are the libraries that we need to actually access the hardware below. Um, on top, you have the Libsigrog client. That is the software actually tries to communicate with the devices and display the data or process it in some way. Um, we'll see in, this in a minute what actually is going on there. But next to it, you see the Libsigrog decode library. It's a library that is kind of on the side of Libsigrog. Um, it's providing protocol decoders, which I will also talk about in a minute. Uh, it's using Python um, and libglib. The first client I would like to talk about is the obligatory um, command line interface. It's um, usable for acquiring data, converting data, decoding data. Essentially, it's a very scriptable tool, so you can do some kind of test automation or whatever you like to do with it. Uh, another client we have is um, Secrog, um Meter. It is uh, tailored for use of multimeters, so you can have all kinds of multimeters um, and measure the data, data log it, um, whatever you want to do with it. Um, it is quite feature rich already, but currently needs a maintainer. So if you feel interested, please come to us and talk to us. Another client that is a relatively recent addition is SMU View. It's um, a program that tries to emulate a source measurement unit using a power supply and um, electronic load. 
I haven't used it personally, but I, am, I have heard it's quite good, so please give it a try. A very even more recent addition is um, the Lipsycroc uh, mini server. Uh, it allows you to access all your devices supported through Lipsycroc using a JSON interface. For example, here you can see Node-RED and uh, interface to provide uh, access to a power supply and electronic load. Finally, we have uh, PulseView, which is our most feature-rich and also um, the most um, popular client that we have. Um, it is available, for example, for Linux, Windows, OS X, and uh, Android, actually. So um, it's quite uh, flexible in, in what we do with it. Um, and here you can see some standard uh, setup. You have two signals, SCL, SCA, um, that have been acquired uh, through some logic analyzer. And we have added a protocol decoder for I2C to actually visualize, visualize the data in some kind of meaningful way. Um, OK, now this is pretty standard. You can do that with any oscilloscope, really. I understand that. But what we do is actually we go one step further and actually allow you to have protocol decoders written in Python um, that you can use to make even more sense of the data that you have. In this example, we have attached a DS1307 real-time clock. Um, so you can actually see what the data means to the chip and what the data means to other chips that comes in and out of a chip that is on the bus. Um, so this is pretty cool because essentially allows you to have any oscilloscope that you have on your bench, if you have a driver for it, or any logic analyzer that you have, to have all kinds of protocols that it doesn't usually support. And we can uh, have a driver for it and um, provide you with all the protocol decoders that you already have. Um, also, what I would like to point out is that um, there is a Cypress FX2 development board available for less than $10 or 10, 10 euro here in Europe, um, which you can use in combination with Sigrog to actually have a 10 euro logic analyzer, which is quite feature rich. And um, since we have currently over 100 protocols available, you suddenly have all kinds of uh, utilities available on your workbench for only 10 euros. So that's quite popular, and also the reason why the Sigrob project is very popular in these kind of circles. I would like to give you some examples of what exactly we have. Also, it's ARM ETM as a decoder. Oh, I have to speed up, okay. Um, which you can use to trace and uh, have code. Uh, this is USB. Um, also with PCAP output, and uh, what it wants to take away is that uh, we try to be a unicorn. Uh, we do have lots of decoders, and we can uh, give you lots of opportunities. If you want to contact us, come to our assembly, or come to Twitter, Mastodon, or just uh, chat, us, uh, chat with us on IRC. Thank you very much. Thank you. So then next up is... Datenkrake gefunden und nun it's going to be a German talk, so you might want to check out the translation page on c3lingo.org for translated streams. Ja, guten Morgen. Mein Englisch wollt ihr nicht hören, deswegen mache ich es lieber auf Deutsch. Äh, mein Name ist Alva Freude, ich bin Mitarbeiter und Referent beim Landesbeauftragten für Datenschutz Baden-Württemberg und ich erzähle euch ein bisschen was zum Thema Datenschutz. Ähm, ja, der eine oder andere wird vielleicht hin und wieder mal über bei der Analyse irgendeiner Software, einer Hardware, einer Webseite oder was auch immer darauf gestoßen sein, dass dort seltsame Datenübertragungen drin sind, die man vielleicht nicht haben will, aus Privatsphärengründen oder Ähnlichen. Ähm, da kann man sich natürlich die Frage stellen, ist das denn über, äh, überhaupt erlaubt? Nun, nein, häufig ist es nicht erlaubt, denn kurz gesagt, Daten ohne gewichtigen Grund oder der Einwilligung des Nutzers zu sammeln, ist häufig nach der Datenschutzgrundverordnung der DSGVO unzulässig. Viele haben vielleicht gehört, die Geschichten mit Klingelschildern und ähnlichen Späßen, die irgendwie durch die Medien gehen, das ist alles Unfug. Aber es gibt viele Sachen, wo ihr auch was tun könnt. Nämlich, ihr könnt euch anschauen, welche Software, welche Hardware, welche ähm, seltsamen Datenübertragungen habt und ähm, ja, gucken, was da 
nicht in Ordnung ist. Zum Beispiel haben wir eine Pflicht zur Datensicherheit. In Artikel 32 steht zum Beispiel die Verschlüsselung explizit drin. Also häufig ist dann tatsächlich so, dass wir auch Verschlüsselung verlangen als Aufsichtsbehörde. Und wir haben die Pflicht zu Privacy by Design und Privacy by Default. Die ergeben sich aus Artikel 25 der Datenschutzgrundverordnung. Beispiele für solche Verstöße sind, wir haben in Baden-Württemberg das erste Bußgeld in Deutschland an eine Firma vergeben ähm, vor ein paar Wochen. Es ähm, ging darum, dass dort ein, ein Unternehmen, seine User, seine User einer, eine, eine, eines Webdienstes, die Daten im Klartext gespeichert hat, und zwar die Passwörter. Brauche ich euch nicht erzählen, warum das böse ist. Die haben ein relativ kleines Bußgeld bekommen, weil sie sehr kooperativ waren und auch ein relativ kleines Unternehmen. Bei größeren Unternehmen kann das dann relativ teuer werden. Ähm, insgesamt können bei der DSGVO Verstöße 20 Millionen kosten oder 4 Prozent des weltweiten Jahresumsatzes. Ähm, ja, unverschlüsselte Datenträger oder USB-Sticks verschicken oder auf Notebooks durch die Gegend tragen, wäre auch so etwas, was man ahnden könnte. Oder je nach Kontext muss man sich es genauer anschauen, aber wer regelmäßig medizinische Daten per E-Mail verschickt, würde auch Probleme kriegen. Ähm, Tracking ohne Einwilligung oder Weitergabe von Nutzerdaten an Dritte wie Facebook Custom Audiences ist auch ähm, nach herrschender Meinung rechtswidrig. Dass die bayerischen Kollegen haben da auch schon Urteile vor Gericht durchgefochten. Ja, was kann man tun? Ihr könnt natürlich irgendwie eure, eure Geräte abdichten, sodass keine Daten rausfließen. Das hilft aber nur euch und das hilft nicht den Leuten, die sich damit nicht so toll auskennen. Ihr könnt aber auch Beschwerde bei der jeweiligen Aufsichtsbehörde einreichen. Bei der Aufsichtsbehörde, die für den Hersteller zuständig ist oder für den Vertrieb oder den, den sonstigen Verantwortlichen, wie man ihn nennt, der die Daten sammelt oder die Aufsichtsbehörde an eurem Wohnort. Ähm, sucht einfach entsprechend mit der Suchmaschine eures geringsten Misstrauens nach Datenschutz, Aufsichtsbehörde, Bundesland und dann findet ihr das. Wie gesagt, hohe Bußgelder kann das ergeben und ähm, die Behörde muss dann auch tätig werden. Also wenn wir Sachen selber irgendwie recherchieren, dann können wir tätig werden, dann müssen wir das nicht zwangsweise machen. Aber wenn ihr eine Eingabe macht, müssen wir tätig werden. Das kann aber auch sein, dass wir aus Baden-Württemberg das dann an Berlin, Hamburg oder Schleswig-Holstein abgeben, wenn dort der Verantwortliche sitzt. Wichtig ist für solche Sachen, sachlich schildern, was denn ähm, was ihr gefunden habt, möglichst viele Details nennen. In den Aufsichtsbehörden sitzen in der Zwischenzeit nahezu überall gute Techniker, die das auch verstehen. Da sind nicht nur Juristen. Die Technikteams sind meistens relativ klein. Wir sind fünf Leute in Stuttgart, in Baden-Württemberg. Aber trotzdem sind da Leute, die verstehen, was ihr da einschickt. Also auch einen TCP-Dump oder sonst was ist jetzt irgendwie den Leuten ein Begriff. Ähm, genau, sachlich schildern, möglichst viele Details nennen. Ihr könnt das auch anonym machen. Ja, also wenn ihr zum Beispiel nicht nur eine Drittsoftware analysiert, sondern bei einem Unternehmen arbeitet, wo ihr sagt, das geht mal überhaupt nicht, was hier passiert und meine Chefs hören nicht auf mich, dass das nicht legal ist und ihr wollt das nicht weiter mittragen, könnt ihr auch anonym als Whistleblower zu den Aufsichtsbehörden kommen und entsprechend eine Eingabe machen. Kleiner Tipp, möglichst irgendeine Kontaktmöglichkeit hinterlassen, weil häufig haben wir dann doch Rückfragen, weil nicht immer alles 100 Prozent klar ist aus den Beschwerden oder Eingaben. Ja, ähm, das mal so als gro großen Rotumschlag. Heute Abend gibt es noch eine Self-Organized Session im Raum M3 zwischen 18.30 Uhr und 20 Uhr. Ähm, da sind mehrere Leute, die was zum Thema Datenschutz erzählen in so 15-Minuten-Blöcken. Da werde ich auch sein. Ich habe das angemeldet und ähm, da schauen wir mal, ob da noch, wenn irgendwelche Fragen sind oder ähm, wenn jemand irgendwelche besonderen Probleme, Wünsche oder Ähnliches hat. 18.30 Uhr, Raum M3, heute Abend. Tschüss. Thank you. Thank you. Then we have uh, one of the usual suspects. Uh, Borg back up. So, hi. Um, I just wanted to give a short update about Borg Backup. And on the first few slides, I have uh, some overview for the people who don't know it yet. Uh, my name is Thomas, and let's see. Uh, so quick, the features of Borg Backup, it's a backup tool, and you usually use it on the command line. So it has a CLI interface like rsync or like Git or whatever. 
But uh, recently, there were also uh, some people working on the GUI. So if you have non-nerdy friends that rather click around, then you can also use it now. Uh, we have quite good architecture and platform and file system support. And the main features are we are doing deduplication. We are doing compression, authenticated encryption. And the usual way you use it, you, you, you read the data from a locally mounted file system, and then you store it to another local file system, or you can also store it to a remote server over SSH, and the one Borg will talk to another Borg on the remote side. A nice feature is uh, you can fuse mount your repositories, your backup archives. And OK, if you, have, if you do not have a remote server, it's no big problem. There are some service providers, meanwhile, that offer such services like, for example, rsync.net or Hetzner. And a new one is borgbase.com. It has a quite nice uh, web interface. And the borgbase guy um, is also programming this nice uh, GUI client. Also, if you don't want to rent the server, you can just search for another nerd, and you can do mutual backups. They are encrypted, so you don't have a big uh, trust issue because the other guy won't be able to look into your backup. Uh, another way to use it, if you rather prefer to have something in the cloud, maybe additionally to your local repository, you can first create a local repository and then push this complete repository to the cloud, for example, using our clone. And of course, if you have your own server, you can just use SSH. Uh, the GUI tool I mentioned is called Volta, and it's implemented in Python uh, and Qt. Currently, it's tested on Linux and on macOS, but it might be even possible in the future maybe to adapt it to Windows. And as I said, you can um, show it to your friends. Uh, another tool is Borgmatic. It's basically a configuration layer on top of Borg. So if you prefer a config file like any style, uh, you can use this tool. And there are lots of other tools and scripts and integrations. And we have a special community repository. And if you search additional tools, you can just look there. Uh, in general, it's a community project, uh, so if you are coding in Python or C or Cython, uh, join us, please. Currently, we are a bit low on uh, developers, but you can also help if you can't code, for example, uh, look after the docs or just test it. Uh, we have a good test suite and using continuous integra integration, and for platform testing, we use Vagrant. Also, we need uh, supporters for different platforms. So if you, for example, use NetBSD or something, also come to us. Uh, the current status is there is an old st stable release out since quite long. Uh, I think you can find it in about every distribution. And the current le release is 1.1. So this is the newest stuff. And the next release, maybe 2019, uh, will mostly have code cleanups, refactorings, and some internal uh, stuff, and also new repository compaction handling. It will be separate, not uh, automatic like now. And for the bigger changes on the bottom, for the Helium milestone, we need more people, because the crypto changes will be a lot of work, and also the multi-threading changes are a lot of work. Um, we also need community supporters, so for example, if you can help people because you use Borg yourself, you can also help and look after GitHub and the mailing list. A security review would be also good. We have some known issues, but also somebody could look over the code. And we also need more sponsors and donations because uh, we do bounties using bounty source. So I'm here at a congress. Uh, find me at a Python assembly. And yeah, I think we are out of time. So you can click on the screencasts using that link. OK, thank you. Thank you. So just a quick reminder, all the slides that uh, the uh, speakers uploaded into our system, uh, you can download them. Uh, just visit 
c3lt.de, also c3lt.de, and there you can download the slides, visit the schedule, and so on. All right, next up is uh, TUM exam. Oh, uh, that's, that was the browser. Let me just move it. That's why I prefer PDFs. So if you want to give a talk here, uh, you, you do best with PDF. It's portable. It's a document format. Okay, let's go. Also zuerst mal, es ist ein PDF, ne? <lacht> okay, also mein Name ist Stefan Günther, ich bin von der Technischen Universität München und ich will heute ganz kurz darüber sprechen, wie wir am Lehrstuhl mit sehr großen schriftlichen Prüfungen fertig werden. Ähm, dazu schauen wir uns mal unsere Grundlagenvorlesung an. Das ist eine Pflichtveranstaltung für alle Informatik-Bachelorstudenten an der TUM. Ähm, 2015 hatten wir 1.152 Klausurvorlagen. Das ist in den letzten drei Jahren auf knapp 1.700 gestiegen, einfach weil wir mehr Studierende haben. 2015 waren es noch 36 Teilaufgaben zu korrigieren, dieses Jahr waren es fast 74.000, liegt neben der gestiegenen Anzahl an Studierenden daran, dass wir jetzt kürzere Aufgaben stellen, die halt einfach leichter zu korrigieren sind. Da wir eine Erst- und Zweitkorrektur haben, waren das dieses Jahr 150.000 Einzelbewertungen, die wir irgendwie haben durchführen müssen. Nur die Anzahl an Papierseiten ist ein bisschen zurückgegangen auf 23.000 Seiten Papier, das lag daran, dass wir einfach ein kürzeres oder kompakteres Template mittlerweile nutzen. Dafür haben wir dieses Jahr äh, noch zusätzlich zweieinhalbtausend Quizze, Multiple-Choice-Quizze gehabt, was weitere 32 Teilaufgaben sind und weitere 5000 Papierseiten waren. So, wie werden wir damit fertig, ohne verrückt zu werden? Naja, wir arbeiten seit 2015 schon an einem eigenen Scanner-Klausurensystem namens TUMXM. Wir versehen die Angaben mit äh, QR-Codes, individuellen QR-Codes. Ähm, wir können so pseudonymisiert korrigieren, weil wir keine Namen auf den Klausuren mehr draufstehen haben. Wir scannen die Klausuren danach ein und erfassen die Bewertungen digital und stellen den Studierenden dann äh, die Klausuren online zur Einsicht zur Verfügung. Wen das interessiert, wie das ganz genau funktioniert, der kann sich unseren Lightning Talk von 2015 angucken, da erklären wir das. Ähm, jetzt will ich noch ganz kurz darauf eingehen, was sich seitdem getan hat. Äh, bis zu ja, dem Zeitpunkt hier Ende 2015 haben wir TUMXM nur am eigenen Lehrstuhl eingesetzt. Das hat sich dann geändert, zunächst an befreundeten Lehrstühlen. Ähm, wir haben um, ja, von QR-Codes auf Data Matrix Codes gewechselt, einfach weil die robuster und flexibler sind. Ähm, wir haben unser Klausur-Template nochmal komplett neu implementiert in LaTeX. Ähm, wir haben die Datenbank neu implementiert, jetzt in Postgres. Wir haben uns in sündhaft teuren Dokumentenscanner gekauft. Dokumentenscanner wären eigentlich einen eigenen Lightning Talk wert. Äh, die Mechanik ist normalerweise ganz toll bei den Geräten, aber die Software ist total Katastrophe. Ähm, seit dem Zeitpunkt haben wir auch eine eigene Plattform für die Online-Einsichten. Ähm, seit Ende 2016 entwickeln wir ein Webinterface zur Klausurverwaltung samt äh, Touch- und Stifteingabe. Ähm, wir haben Anfang 2017 das sogenannte Karpfinger Klausurkonzept integriert. Wenn es interessiert, ist es am Ende von den Folien verlinkt. Ähm, es ist ein Konzept für besonders kompakte Mathematikprüfungen. Wir unterstützen neuerdings Quizze und Multiple-Choice-Prüfungen. Wir haben zwischen Mai und Oktober 2017 über siebeneinhalb Klausuren und Quizze in ein bisschen mehr als 20 Veranstaltungen mit dem System abgewickelt. Wir haben uns im Zuge dessen dann auch einen richtigen VM-Server besorgt. Seit Ende 2017 beschäftigen wir uns auch mit der Integration von voll digitalen Prüfungen in TUMXM. Wir haben uns eben wegen der Problematik mit den Scannern ein eigenes Scanner-Frontend implementiert. Ähm, unser Webinterface ist jetzt seit Anfang des Jahres endlich nutzbar geworden. Ähm, in der studentischen Arbeit haben wir eine automatische Synchronisation mit der Einsichtsplattform implementiert. Ähm, auch eine studentische Arbeit beschäftigt sich gerade mit einer iPad-App zur volldigitalen Korrektur von Prüfungen. Äh, wir unterstützen neuerdings auch äh, fremde Klausurvorlagen, die eben nicht unser LaTeX-Template verwenden. Und ja, heute war mal wieder ein Lightning Talk. Wen das Thema interessiert, kann am Stuhlstandet SMB vorbeikommen. Wir haben ein bisschen Anschauungsmaterial dabei. Ähm, können wir uns einfach mal ein bisschen austauschen. Und wen es wirklich interessiert, äh, vielleicht kann es auch mal jemand von euch nutzen. Danke. Danke. Next up is Irma, I reveal my attributes. There's a, if you click the left image. Oh, I, I'm already supposed to click the link, okay. <laughs> Let's see what happens. You have been owned. No, ah, okay. 
that's uh, that's a PDF, right? Yeah, it's a PDF. You can also just uh, okay. Kind of it Maybe I can put it here on full screen. Oh, okay. Does this work? Yeah, this work. Okay. Um, I want to introduce uh, Irma to you. It's an uh, uh, open source project in which uh, you can uh, privacy friendly, secure, uh, and decentrally uh, um, provide authentication and signing. So. Um, for the user, uh, the most central thing is uh, uh, the app that you see on the left side is on uh, iOS and Android. Um, and uh, the project is intended to uh, yeah, authenticate and sign statements about yourself with attributes you uh, collect on your own mobile phone. Uh, so for example, you see uh, a login to uh, AirMatube, our uh, demo application, but there is also in the Netherlands uh, a few uh, attributes from uh, governments which you can collect, and you can then later prove those uh, that information to to others uh, in a way that they can be sure that the information is correct, uh, but also that um, th those people don't learn anything about your interactions online. Uh, that's a key difference uh, between how authentication is done uh, nowadays. Uh, for example, when you click a, a login with Google or a login with Facebook link uh, uh, at this moment. Um, you uh, have a user identity provider and uh, you want to log in on a web store, for example. Um, at, this, uh, at the moment, you first go to the web store that has a page uh, that says, uh, I want to log in with Google. So you go to your, uh, the identity provider to Google and then the identity provider reveals uh, the login information to the web store. So Google now knows what you're doing. Um, and um, that probably isn't, uh, maybe is the problem if you want to order something, but if you want to uh, log in in your doctor's office, for example, you don't want all those companies collecting that information. So uh, what we um, want to provide as a different solution is that uh, you collect all the statements that uh, allow you to log in somewhere uh, on your mobile phone. So you first go to an identity provider, you collect those statements, and then uh, you reveal them to the web store without um, communicating with the identity provider anymore. Um, and you can do that uh, again and again, and you don't need to contact that identity provider again to, to uh, do another login or do another authentication. So um, the security guarantees we have is that the, the attributes, the information in the app, that it is authentic, it's signed with a, a digital signature, um, it's, um, well, you, you can prove ownership. There's, uh, you need to prove knowledge of the IRMA PIN, so you need to uh, fill in a PIN code to, to say you have knowledge of that. There's a secret key stored on your uh, mobile phone that also uh, says that you own those attributes. So um, you have a two-factor authentication. Um, the disclosures you do are also in another way unlinkable. Um, it, we use a credentials, uh, an attribute-based credential scheme called EDMIX. Uh, which, uh, if you do two disclosures, it uh, makes it unlinkable. So it's a, a multi-show unlinkable uh, credential scheme, um, and that makes that if you, uh, as long as you have attributes and that don't reveal anything about yourself, for example, if there is an attribute that says I'm over 18 or I'm a, a German citizen, for example, if you reveal those attributes to someone, uh, they can see that you're the same person uh, two times. So, so the attributes are, are not linkable as long as they, the attributes themselves are not identifiable. And uh, there's this uh, kind of automatic, automatic dat data minimization uh, because um, you only reveal the attributes that you really need to, uh, that the, the one who's, uh, who, who you're proving them to really needs to see. So you only show relevant attributes. Uh, you need to uh, give your consent if you want to, uh, want to hand them to. So, so uh, a typical session goes, you go to the website of the web store here, you scan a QR code or you click on a link, the IRMA app then opens. Uh, it asks you, hey, this web store wants to know this and this information uh, of you. You then either consent or you don't. Um, and then uh, go ahead, uh, prove those attributes without involving anyone except you and the one on the other side, the, the web store in this case. Um, we also do signatures, so um, there's also, um, in, uh, since the, the 90s, it's also it's been a problem to uh, give people access to, uh, to proper signatures. You have to um, uh, create a public key infrastructure and people have to collect their uh, own signature and have to manage their private keys. Uh, we also, uh, with this, have uh, attribute-based signatures, so you collect those attributes, for example, your um, government numbers, uh, BSN in Dutch, um, and you can um, uh, um, uh, sign um, any message you want. So, for example, here I can send to share data with my doctor. You can uh, sign that data, sign that statement with an attribute, and then can yeah, prove that you have uh, you have um, retrieved that, that attribute from from the government in this case. So, in the Netherlands, we do this with uh, DigiDay. You log in with uh, DigiDay, and then you collect your your information. 
Um, it, it, anyone can do this. It's a decentralized system. Um, there's some more information about this. We're an open source project. You can see it on our GitHub. Um, the core is in, uh, written in Go. We're transitioning uh, for the server part to Go as well. It's a Java server at this moment. Um, you can uh, see some more information if you want to join uh, a Slack in which we communicate about this. You can ask for an invite. And uh, well, you can download the app. Um, please do so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Last talk before the break. It's going to be in German. Auf Deutsch. Warum wir zwei Jahre lang Wikibooks ausgedruckt haben. Ja, hallo. Wir wollten schon immer mal Teile des Internets ausdrucken und haben das dann mal mit einer Plattform von Wikibooks äh, probiert. Und als Ergebnis halten wir hier das wohl schönste in Druckform vorliegende Wikibooks derzeit in Händen. Das Wikibook, was wir gewählt haben, ist Mathe für Nicht-Freaks. Kennt das zufällig jemand? Okay, doch ein paar. Freut mich. Ähm, hier sehen wir jetzt schon ein bisschen überarbeitetes Design von unserem Designer. Das Ziel ist einfach, dass man Studenten die Hochschulmathematik verständlich rüberbringt. Und dazu verwenden wir eingebettete Medien, Bilder, äh, haben diese semantischen äh, Sachverhalte ordentlich dargestellt mit so Definitionsboxen und so weiter. Und wie man unten rechts sieht, betten wir auch Videos ein. Dieses Wikibook-Projekt gehört seit einiger Zeit zu Serlo. Das ist eine andere Lernplattform für Gymnasiasten. Und auch da wird multimedial gearbeitet. Und ähm, wie man sieht, geht es hier nicht nur um die Inhalte der Lehre, sondern auch darum, diese Lehre frei verfügbar zu machen und die Organisationsprozesse transparent und demokratisch zu halten. Funktioniert das Ganze? Da geben zunächst mal die Nutzerzahlen recht. Also hier 800.000 Nutzer für Serlo und 110.000 bei Mathe für Nichtfreaks. Und auch das Buch wurde ähm, inzwischen bis zu 10.000 Mal heruntergeladen. Das Projekt Serlo an sich ging ursprünglich in München los, hat sich aber in den letzten Jahren äh, über Deutschland verbreitet. Wir sind jetzt also die Nutzergruppe in Dresden, aber auch in Berlin und Münster findet man inzwischen Standorte. Ja. Genau. Äh, warum wir das Wikibook ausgedruckt haben, kann man sich vielleicht vorstellen. Wir wollen eine Alternative zu konventionellen, ähm, teilweise sehr teuren ähm, Lehrmaterial schaffen. Äh, das Buch ist jetzt auch in der äh, Bibliothek der LMO München zu finden. Die Frage ist nur, warum haben wir dafür jetzt zwei Jahre gebraucht? Haut man nicht einfach die Wiki-Artikel durch Pandoc und schon hat man ein Buch? Naja, ganz so einfach ist das nicht. Zum einen haben wir sehr viel semantisches Markup, worauf wir auch sehr stolz sind. Allerdings können wir deswegen nicht einfach äh, ein Konvertierungstool wie Pandoc verwenden, weil es für jedes Target anders aussehen kann. Also zum Beispiel in PDF wollen wir Definitionen oder auch Medien anders darstellen als im HTML beispielsweise. Zum anderen sie, ähm, haben wir auch noch weitere Dependencies, nicht nur die Artikelinhalte. Hier sieht man diesen roten Punkt in der Mitte. Das ist das eigentliche Buch und alle anderen Punkte sind die Dependencies. Dieses grüne dort zum Beispiel sind sämtliche Mediendateien, also hauptsächlich Videos und Bilder. Dieses gelbe dort oben in der Ecke sind Teile aus Artikeln, die in anderen Artikeln wiederverwendet werden und in diesem Kreis sieht man Teile von ähm, den, also sieht man die Artikel, wie sie erst im Quelltext vorliegen, anschließend konvertiert werden äh, in ein Zwischenformat, anschließend exportiert werden und dann zum Buch zusammengeführt werden. Ähm, das ganze System ähm, ist ein ähm, ja, Bildsystem, also auf Make basiert, welches verschiedene Rust-Tools aufruft. Momentan sieht das im Groben so aus. Wir haben unsere Wiki-Plattform, ähm, ein Parser erzeugt eine Zwischenrepräsentation und aus dieser exportieren wir dann die tatsächlichen Artikel. Und äh, wir haben auch noch einen Linter, der unseren Autoren automatisch Hinweise geben kann. Dank Rust können wir das Ganze dann auch im Browser laufen lassen. Zukünftig wollen wir allein diese beiden Plattformen ein bisschen ähm, besser vereinen und ähm, dann natürlich auch das Aufwand sparen. Deswegen ist das Ziel, ähm, die Seiten von Mathe für Nicht-Freaks in der Zwischenrepräsentation zu überführen, die mit Serlo kompatibel ist, auf den Basis wir dann den Linter implementieren können und weitere Exporttargets hinzufügen können, zum Beispiel E-Books wären sehr schön, dass wir nicht so viel Totholz am Ende haben. Genau, ähm, wenn ihr mit uns in Kontakt kommen wollt oder irgendwelche Anregungen habt, wir sind auch äh, immer sehr interessiert an Vorschlägen für die Weiterentwicklung der Plattform, auch in technischer Hinsicht, das für uns vor allem. Ähm, es gibt hier die E-Mail-Adresse von Serlo Allgemein, wenn ihr euch gerade für, diesen, für dieses Exportprojekt interessiert oder irgendwas ähm, in der Nähe von Dresden seid und an Serlo interessiert seid, könnt ihr uns kontaktieren. Ansonsten gerne auch hier auf dem Kongress, man findet uns 
momentan sehr häufig an der AGDSN Assembly oder ruft uns einfach an. Vielen Dank. Danke. Thank you. Uh, next up is OpenAge, and we already have the slides on the screen, so we can just go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, we're a small part of the OpenAge development team. We're uh, doing a, a free re-implementation of Age of Empires 2. I'm Jonas. And I'm Michael. So uh, what we are doing, uh, we, are, we have been developing a, a free engine clone for Age of Empires 2, the Conquerors expansion. Uh, we started in 2013, and since then, yeah, we have been doing it. <laughs> uh, our game requires the original game assets, so you have to like own a copy of the original game, but we have been writing a completely new engine uh, with unlimited uh, possibilities for modding and so on. Uh, the original game engine is quite limited, starting with the fact that it only runs on Windows. Um, uh, it's a short overview of the technology which we are using. Uh, the engine core is written in C++, uh, but uh, there is an extensive interface to call most of the engine features from Python 3. Uh, we are using Scython as glue and CMake, OpenGL, Vulkan isn't even mentioned here, uh, SDL, Qt, and we have our own uh, data description language, Neon, but uh, more on that later. Uh, so this is what it's currently looking like. <laughs> and uh, in the last year, we have had three main advancements. Uh, VTech wrote a new uh, renderer. Then uh, we've got a new world simulation engine, which is completely event-driven, which was uh, done by Tomato. And we have a new modding API, which was designed by Heinesen. All of those advancements are mostly in the background, so there is little stuff uh, which is actually visible, which has changed in the last year, but now we are ready to integrate everything together and basically finish the game. <laughs> so um, the uh, no new central component of the engine uh, is, um, and is uh, entity component based and this is the game en entity which uh, has abilities. Abilities are now in green um, and bony Bony are things like the unit is standing on a hill and therefore has more attack uh, damage or and the abilities are permanent uh, things uh, entity can do for example exist move die attack whatever in uh, practice uh, in our own description language this in a simplified way uh, is a villager that just exists with 25 hp and can move and die the definitions of move die attack are not here now but um, with that way, it's possible that uh, any entity can do everything. And so trees, for example, can uh, train new units, or animals can convert villagers, or rel relics can even start to chop wood, if you like. So um, this API overview here is the whole thing that is able to uh, um, simulate Age of Empires 2. The green uh, boxes are, again, all the abilities. Um, we have new things like actual inventory management, so the monk transporting a relic is uh, implemented properly and not a new unit that is a combination of uh, the relic and the monk, for example. And our system supports uh, nonlinear attack trees, so uh, you have can have arbitrary conditions uh, chained together for advancements in uh, discoveries for your technologies, and uh, this is implemented the following way. So a technology is again just an entity, and the uh, entity, uh, the technology has the most important parameter, the updates, uh, all at the bottom, which is a set of patches. Patches are a special feature of our uh, neon language that uh, allow to change values on the fly in the database. 
So in this case, the update is on line 9, which is the more HP patch that updates villager live by adding 15 uh, new health points. So whenever this technology is activated, then the database is updated. Um, with uh, the same trick, we can do uh, things like attack and defense, so that, uh, for example, ranged attacks and ranged armor are matched up uh, and produce the correct amount of damage. And we can do very complicated things, like transforming uh, the uh, trebuchet into packed and unpacked. And this whole thing is fed into the event engine, as I said, which uh, basically is a history of everything in the game, in past and uh, the future. And what the engine, what the what the client only does is play back that view. So it's just a snapshot. So next is funny new things, like data conversions. Four, and that three, was it already. Two, Join us one. and help us develop a cool thing. Thanks. Thank you. Next up is um, crypto payments in hyperinflation countries and beyond. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, my name is Felix. I'm from the Dash Embassy Thailand. And for the last couple of months, we were very busy basically trying to bring cryptocurrencies from a high level talk to street level reality. And uh, it's really a challenge. And I want to share some uh, experiences with you, also experiences the other teams had on the example of Dash. Um, so cryptocurrencies basically have been the most um, famous use case since we talk about blockchain, since we talk about Bitcoin. But still, almost 10 years later, nobody basically sees any option to pay with cryptocurrencies in the real world. And it's really a challenge to do that, right? You were always talking about uh, the freedom of banking system. Um, at the same time, so many cryptocurrencies are there at the moment. And uh, I just read a new study saying more than 60% of all these tokens are basically cryptocurrencies compared to any other utility token or something. Um, so for the example of Dash, um, you can see quite a, a big increase of uh, acceptances worldwide. So we, had, uh, we started with 500 this year and up to 4,500. If you look at Bitcoin numbers and uh, all other currencies, it's not that much higher, actually. Or even, even worse, it's very hard to get good statistics because there are some maps you can uh, register your, comp your company if you accept Bitcoins or whatever other currency, but it's um, uh, not really that you can go anywhere and get an, a proper number of how many, how many cryptocurrencies acceptances are in the world. Um, so for Dash, especially Venezuela turned out to be use case number one. If you uh, look at it, it makes total sense. Venezuela has an inflation rate of uh, 1.4 million percent for this year. So people are really struggling. If you go uh, in the morning, buy some eggs, you need some money. If you go in the evening, you need uh, quite much more money. So Dash managed to get really uh, a growing and healthy ecosystem in Venezuela. Um, so that we can basically say, if you have a hyperinflation country, cryptocurrency is a fabulous use case, right? And there's not only Venezuela, we have Turkey, we have uh, some, some countries in Africa. There's more and more countries coming up um, where this totally makes sense. But of course, for me, I mean, from a business perspective, it would be very sad to say we focus only on the hyperinflation countries. We want to go beyond that, right? Of course, you have to have everything in place. You have to have the regulators, you have to have taxes, you have to pay your taxes, you have to do everything. And if you talk to merchants, and that's especially the point, you will find out they have many questions. And the most important thing, they don't really care for cryptocurrencies. What they care for is a simple solution which fits into their business process, and they don't want to have any investment, right? For uh, additional software, for additional hardware, for additional stuff training. So that's why we go to the merchants, we try to really understand what they want and how we can help them setting up a system and afterwards also giving support to them and answering questions, right? Because if you start with crypto payments and you really go to the street level, there will be more and more things and questions popping up from taxes to, to regulations, um, to, to how to integrate it into POS systems. So there's many, many things and, and it's ongoing questions, right? 
One other thing is we, we started with the low-hanging fruits for us in Thailand, going to every single Bitcoin shop there, right? Who claims to accept Bitcoin and has a sticker on the door. Just realizing everybody just forgot it, right? So we go, we went into these stores and people look at us and say, be what? So they, they don't even know what Bitcoin was, right? Because the stuff in there, they forgot it already a long time. So that's why I say it's really important to give them ongoing support and to help them basically solve a problem. And the biggest problem they have is they want to make business, right? This is what they really care for. They want to, have a, they want to sell their products. They want to um, get more customers. And at the end of the day, they want to get happy customers because happy customers will come back in their stores, right? So that's why our approach for the example of Thailand and also um, Venezuela is going a bit in that direction is growing healthy ecosystems. That means um, you have to have to, the whole set of things together. One thing is the exchanges. You have to get your, your money back. You have to manage a cash flow as a merchant, right? So basically, you have to choose, do I want to keep my cryptocurrency for speculative reasons? Or um, will I sell it instantly when I get it, right? You have to have the payment providers. You have to have, of course, you have to pay your taxes at the end of the day. This is the one side, and the other side is the customers coming in, right? You need a, a community coming and paying with that stuff. Only huddling is really not paying with it, right? So you need people who come in the stores, help, and all that. So at the end of the day, it all boils down Five, to sustainable four, ecosystems. Three, two, Thank you. One. I'm here for questions. Thank you. Next up is Barkcon. Good morning. Uh, I'm Jelena from Balkan Orga team. I'm here to present our conference, small hacking event that's happening in Serbia, Novi Sad. So for the next year, it will be the uh, seventh, time, seventh time that we organize this event. It's uh, Balkan Computer Congress. The dates are already set up, so it will be second week in September, 14, 14, 15 September. Now we said, so remember it. Uh, what exactly is Balkan? Uh, we got an idea 10 years ago on CCC to start organizing small conference in Serbia because there is a lot of students in Novi Sad, there is a big technical university, and want to, we wanted to share with them this experience that we have here. And we want to introduce the young people from that Balkan region with the hacking culture. So that's the reason why we started organizing this, and now it starts to be an annual event. We are doing it that we are saying just for fun, because we have a lot of fun there. So we are inviting you to join us next year if you weren't there yet. So this is the important dates. The place is Novi Sad, Serbia. And uh, the CFP will be open from February somewhere. And um, the complete list of speakers will be somewhere end of July. And yes, we also have uh, the CTF. We are organizing every year. So if you are not able to come, you can also join playing the CTFs and have fun with us. And who was this year with us? We got uh, some also famous speakers. Travis Goodspeed was a couple of times in on Balkan virus from US. Mitch Altman was there also with soldiering more than uh, Rob from US. So there is a long list. So if you're interested in what we are doing previous years, you can also check our website. And there is a complete archive with the videos that you can watch so that you know what how it looks like. And What's important? Yes, we have there a lot of fun. We have uh, some, uh, let's say, that's tradition on second day we, in the evening we have rakia tasting or rakia leaks. So if you don't know what's rakia and want to try different sorts of rakia, you are welcome to come. Also, if you want to try here rakia on our Balkan assembly, you can come and try it just in advance to be prepared what you can expect. <laughs> so, 
I'm just informing you. So, uh, Balkan, why, why, uh, why Novi Sad? It's our hometown, so we started organizing there. But uh, Novi Sad is on the list of Lonely Planet, I think somewhere in the top 10 to visit next year. So, it's a nice city, cheap. Food is very good, incredible. You can ask other people who already visit us how it's food and um, how it's uh, cheap accommodation. And the travel, it's very easy to come because it's only one hour from Belgrade airport, so it's very easy. Or three hours from Budapest, so you can choose it. If you have questions what we are doing and why we are doing that, you can also send us an email. We are responding very quickly and you can also visit our website or you can track it us on the Twitter. Also here on Balkan Assembly, here near in the Chaos West Hall, you can find us, go, grab some stickers, we have some cool stickers also this year and also some flyers. So you can come or you can just talk to see what we have. Also what we have, we try to bring there also hacking community to build a community. We also have hacking space area. So if you are from some hacker spaces, you can organize LICAM got also some assembly. So it will be nice to join us because we also have some blinking stuff and we want to bring it more and more to make it more shiny. So remember next September, 13, 14, 15, please come join us to have a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. Now next up is exploiting WPS PBC on Windows 10. All right, uh, hi guys. Uh, my name is George. Uh, I'm the author of Wi-Fi Fisher. Well, Wi-Fi Fisher is an uh, open source rogue access point framework. Um, so today we're going to talk about exploiting WPS PBC on Windows 10. This is a Wi-Fi association attack. How many of you know the Karma attack? Please raise your hands. OK, I see some hands. So Karma is a very popular association technique. What it basically does is getting money in the middle for the attacker. Uh, but there are others. Uh, in this talk, we're going to talk about one attack um, by exploiting WSPSPBC that actually achieves the same result, money in the middle over Wi-Fi. So uh, WPSPBC, I guess most of you already know it. Uh, it's a feature that uh, allows you to associate a device with an access point very easily just by pushing a button on the access point side and then another button on the device side. It doesn't matter the, the order, right? You can push the, the device first and then you can push the button on the access point later. But you need to do that within 120 seconds. So uh, there are no other authentication uh, mechanisms in place. This is how WPS PBC works. So you see this is the station. It could be a laptop. It could be a mobile device. You push a virtual button there. Then within 120 seconds, you need to push the button on the access point. And these two, uh, the association happens, and the station is now connected to the access point. What's the problem here? The problem is that someone can push the button faster than the, than the operator of the access point, right? So it will achieve a man in the middle position because the station will connect to the rogue access point instead. Um, so this is a, the, the way to achieve a man in the middle attack over WPS PBC. In order for this to happen, of course, the victim needs to push the virtual button uh, on his station. The thing is that even if you don't use WPS PBC actively, you are still vulnerable on Windows 10. Uh, and let's see why this happens. The problem with Windows 10 is that if you select a WPS network, then you automatically, the, the Windows 10 pushes the WPS PBC virtual button for you. Even if you are not actively using it, you are <laughs> eventually. Um, so this is actually a usability sec uh, over security feature that uh, Microsoft introduced for another usability over security feature, which is WPS PBC. How can we exploit this? First, I, I will show four steps, right? So the first step is that let's say that the victim is connected to a WPA, WPA2 network. We do nothing here. Everything, the, the victim is happy. Um, of course, uh, the victim uses a Windows 10 laptop. So what we're going to do first is disconnect the victim from the network. We can do that via common methods. We can craft the authentication frames, for example. 
Uh, we can uh, leverage jamming techniques. There are many ways to do that. So we, we want to disconnect the victim from the network that is currently connected to. As soon as we do that, the victim, we expect the victim to manually click on the network to reestablish the lost connection. But at the same time, we advertise the same network, same SSID, uh, with a random password, if it's a WPA2 password. But this time, we also offer WPS PBC capabilities. So can you guess what will happen? The victim will click on the network, and the virtual WPS button will get pushed from his side. So what, what we need to do now? We simply press the button from our side as well, and the victim will eventually connect to our rogue access point. Uh, the victim will probably have the impression of the auto-connect feature. Do you know the auto-connect feature? The feature where uh, you go back to work and uh, you see that your device is connected automatically to the network, even if you had connected to it like a week ago. This is the auto-connect feature. So that uh, it will give the impression to the victim that it auto-connected because of this feature. Um, so what is funny about this is that uh, the network can be closed. It, it will have the same SSID. It will be WPA2 protected. You will just click on the network that you want to connect, but still, you will connect to a different one. And again, the problem here is that Microsoft has, let's say, tied um, clicking on a network with pushing the WPS PBC button on the client side. Uh, this hasn't been disclosed before. It's the first time that I'm uh, disclosing this. Uh, and you can do this attack by using the latest version of Wi-Fi Fisher. Uh, we're going to push an update soon, so you will be able to do this attack for your penetration testing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, next up is human connection. Free and open source social network for active citizenship. OK, hello, everyone. My name is Robert. I am one of the developers of Human Connection, which is a free and open source social network for active citizenship. Now, I want to highlight a problem. Let's say you are a user of a social network, for example, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and um, you use the social network as a primary source of information. Then you are not in control of your newsfeed anymore. Why? Facebook, YouTube are private companies. The source code is closed source, and the algorithm determines what information you will see, what content you see, if they run ads, um, also what ads you see. And that's why I demand that social networks should be free and open source software. The definition of free software, the users control the program. Non-free software is if the program controls the user. That is the case for Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Therefore, we are developing a free and open source social network, which is funded by uh, donations. And um, we are almost sustainable. We need uh, 30K per month uh, for a team of ten, uh, 10 people. And um, I'm showing you this uh, chart because I want to show that uh, this works. There's a market, let's say, for uh, donation-funded software. Also, I want to highlight that free software is, it is very important that um, free software is funded by donations. Why? Facebook and YouTube have their advertising customers, and they will probably implement features that are not in the interest of the users, right? Free software is community-driven, and since the users control the program, features should always be in line with the interests of the user. So Facebook will show you ads. That's definitely not in your interest. Facebook will collect your data. That's also not in your interest. Whereas free software will not do that. Human Connection is free and open source software. We will not send, show you any ads. And also, we are not uh, collecting your data. Or if you do, we do it on a certain purpose. And you can see our open source code on GitHub and see how it works. So. 
We are currently in a technology transition. You can check out our current staging environment. Um, it's called Nitro. Uh, you can see a link on the right side. You can also see the login credentials on the right side. Uh, you can go there right now and try it out. Since we are in a technology transition, I will tell you what we are using. For this version, we are using Vue.js in the front end, and we are using Node.js on the back end side. Both parties communicate through GraphQL as an interface, and on the back end side, we're using Neo4j as the primary database. The former version, we have 4,000 users, and 2,300 of them are active donators. Yes, and probably you have heard about similar initiatives like that. You probably know Mastodon, you probably know Diaspora, and there are many more. And it's, we want to collaborate with these. Uh, we, there's good news, there's a W3C standard, which is called ActivityPub. It's a, like a language, how different social networks can communicate with each other. That is, um, they can exchange content. And from the user perspective, it's, um, it doesn't really matter uh, which social network you should join. Well, that's the dream. And we are not implementing it yet, but we are intended to do so. And we have bi-weekly meetings with other social networks, including Common Nectar, uh, WeChange, and even Nextcloud. Uh, they all are interested in implementing ActivityPub and we're trying to learn, get familiar with it, and eventually implement it. If you want, you can join us. Here's the chat for our, uh, let's say, we call it the open apps ecosystem, the network of the networks. And we are also having a weekly meeting uh, for the open source community. And that's the link on the right side. Um, we have weekly meetings, and we try our best to onboard open source contributors. We do pair pro programmings. Uh, we do video conferences. Three. Feel free to join us. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is iOS privacy. Hi. So, um, quickly, a few words about me, who I am. Uh, I am uh, both uh, the Apple guy at Third Gate, a security company, but I'm also an uh, activist and politician in, in f things like uh, refugees and, uh, and say, trying to save a forest for a mean, environment, uh, for a mean energy company. Um, so I built a sample app called My Privacy where I'm going into, it's a very simple sim simple app where I'm uh, uh, showing you the different stuff that uh, are important on iOS and that developers should do and that uh, users should uh, also look at. And it's things like the contacts API, the calendar API location and yada 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 and surprisingly enough, Siri. I was surprised the first time that I was researching on this because Siri turned out to be something that was appearing uh, in, uh, uh, by default for every app. So it's default, it's an uh, opt-out. Um, it's uh, in the, the app is in settings Siri, um, but in the uh, Siri and search is not always in the settings app. It's a little bit confusing. Um, and it says, as you can see over there on the, on the screenshot, it says that it's, uh, it may learn and make some decisions based on how you use the app. I was wondering what it actually means. It based, uh, that's basically what they mean is a, is a sort of succession, which is um, a good thing, but at the same time also kind of a pain in the ass as a user. Um, the most of the stuff, actually all the stuff of, of Siri is on device, so it's good to know. Um, the the speed to, uh, speak to text now is not on device, so that's something uh, you, you should know. Um, the gist of all the stuff on iOS uh, in terms of, of, uh, of, of privacy is that it all goes through uh, a set of permissions you get. Uh, for the photos, it's kind of the same as for um, the events or the contacts. It's, uh, it's a lot of time just an enum which gives you if, if, if it's authorized, denied, or if it's not yet asked. If it's restricted, you're out of luck because it's mean it's either parental settings or uh, something, uh, uh, something else in an enterprise. Um, the, app, the, the app will crash, luckily, if you haven't done this, which is 
adding uh, uh, what's called uh, uh, a description, a usage description. This is something which is going to be shown to the user. This is just to visualize your photos on a map. Uh, and it's also going to be checked by uh, Apple. It should be checked, at least, um, uh, in the review process that you are telling to your users what you are actually doing with it. So please t tell the users what you are actually doing with it and don't, don't lie on your users. So there's a bunch of those uh, which are basically in, a, uh, in your info peer list. It start, they all start with privacy and you have to explain whatever you're going to do with calendars or Bluetooth or whatever. Uh, you can also ask again, that's something good to know, by calling this URL, which is basically the open uh, settings URL string. Uh, it's not going to pop up the, the permission settings an, uh, anymore, but it's going to be um, able, uh, the user is going to be able to land up in this page, which is uh, basically uh, in, the, in the privacy over there. Uh, so you have to always check the authorization status, uh, obviously, uh, and uh, there are ways that you can retrieve data from, for example, from a, a metadata uh, for uh, if you get, for example, the uh, the location over there. So this is going way too fast. Please use the pickers. That's very important uh, uh, because if you don't use the pickers, then the people will have to have to give access to the full thing. Also, if you want to be a good developer, uh, please uh, only uh, pick up a, cell, a set of data and don't take everything else because uh, that's what a bad developer would do uh, and that's uh, take a lot of information. That's what an ugly developer would do. Take all the information for all the server uploaded on the thing. So please, don't be that guy. Uh, have a good karma. And just uh, also, uh, you uh, don't need to ask the permissions. A lot of time you can use against the picker. There's something else on the contacts API as well, you, where you can only have one of the pickers. Um, also, um, the contacts have a location, even if they don't have a latitude longitude, because if they have a postal address, you can retrieve this. Um, so with uh, like geocoding, uh, so this is something to know. Uh, you can uh, also, um, the other thing that I wanted you to know is that um, the location API is interesting because MapKit already knows where I am, uh, even though I didn't allow him to tell him. You might think it's because of the region settings, but it's not. It's most probably the IP address. I would prefer if they actually ask me before they centralize this map on where I am. Um, on the location API, when you request the authorization, you have to use a when in user always. Uh, please do not directly ask the full uh, Monty. Ask first this, and then you would be able to avoid this guy, because the second time you will ask, you will have only this. And um, that's uh, basically, I'm running out of time. There is something on the calendars, which is taking okay. all the thing. Four, if you want to know more three, about this, just get two, in touch with me. One. I will be happy to show you this. Thank you for this animated slideshow. Nice. All right, um, next up is uh, Tree Area Network. <clears throat> Hello, uh, my name is Ingo. I wanted to share an experiment with you. I did uh, earlier this year. It's called Tan Tree Area Network. Um, and when I put up this uh, presentation, I basically thought, well, it's actually a bunch of uh, holiday images I share with you. But before I do that, um, what is uh, capacitive coupling? Um, that is uh, a technique to trans transmit or transfer information uh, through capacitive coupling, uh, which means uh, you have uh, information, you go uh, into something, you encode it, you amplify that, you send it into a biological conductor, like a human being. Human being is a very good uh, conductor, uh, like a capacitor. It uh, has very low resistance in internally and a skin, which is high resistance. So it does capacitive couple to another part of the body or another body. But then you can take this information out and uh, decode it and get the information back. Um, that works with humans. It also works with plants. So. Um, what I did at um, the Dynacon uh, Digital Natural, uh, Naturalist Conference in 2018 in Phuket in Thailand is I wanted to try out uh, capacitive coupling uh, devices I built for um, e-textiles in the first uh, case, but uh, the experiment was to use it on trees and if possible to use it to send information from one tree to another and then use the jungle as a network and send one bit of information from one side of the jungle to the other side of the jungle. So I wanted to try it out if it works at all. 
Uh, that was the first experiment. I just uh, stuck uh, this capacitive uh, uh, plates on some uh, plants, and you see my face, it didn't really work. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you see the oscilloscope, it's uh, picked up very, very low signals. Um, that was the second attempt. I uh, wrapped around um, the uh, capacitive, like the, 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 the electrode around the tree, and it worked much better. Uh, you see that in the signal. Uh, picked a very good signal, so I can decode information again. Uh, what could I do? I could uh, transmit data for 5.4 meters from one tree to the bottom of the tree. Uh, that is how the schematics looks like. The transmitter is a simple resonant circuit, uh, transmitting a carry wave of 300 kilohertz. A receiver is basic radio uh, stuff amplifying and filtering, basically. Uh, that is how it looks on a tree. Uh, left is the transmitter with a sensor. It transmits the data over the tree, um, picked up by another part of the tree on the right side, and uh, sent to a computer. Uh, the, the data is sent over serial to a computer to, to read out. Um, that's some details. Uh, what, it can, what, what the implementation can do. A simple on-off on keying. Um, the next step uh, was uh, the costume tan uh, tree area network for tree huggers. So how do we pick up information from trees? We can hug the tree. Uh, it does capacitive couple from the tree to the human body. We can then get the data out of the human body. Um, and that's what we did. <laughs> We decoded information, we don't understand what it says. <laughs> so the scientist uh, is reading the signal from the probe, from the human probe, getting the data from the tree. Right. So if you want to try that uh, out yourself, uh, everything is uh, up on GitHub and on my webpage. Um, try it out, have fun, thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is GNU Linux Improved. Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Zem, uh, or Hans. And um, as you have seen um, uh, two talks ago, it is very hard to uh, make the security right in iOS. And Linux is not the problem here because uh, all the features aren't there exactly. So, um, and I think that is wrong. And 2018 OS should be able to restrict applications from modifying each other's data and restrict applications from spying the user's habits. So, um, yeah, situation is that all applications have the same permissions. USB drivers are fetched automatically. Uh, Xorg is a whole security nightmare. And uh, processes can read any data in home user. And uh, also, there are interfaces that doesn't need to be exposed to each application you are running. So yeah, there are a few developments. Um, uh, there, uh, you, we, have, we always have the um, ability to uh, make uh, Unix POSIX users groups. We have AppArmor. We have SE Linux. We have KVM, we have namespaces, uh, we have USB guard, um, uh, Docker, Xpra. There are some uh, Linux distribution projects like Cubes OS or, um, uh, or uh, Subgraph OS, uh, which are trying to improve uh, the security as well. So uh, I have still some questions left. Um, uh, 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 for example, um, uh, do you remember that there is a policy in Debian uh, that there has to be a man page for every Unix command on the system? Uh, so, also, why do we still have XTM? Why do we have still um, uh, uh, those uh, uh, graphical display managers? Uh, so it, uh, it, it doesn't make sense to have a graphical display manager uh, uh, if you don't have to switch the, um, the display resolution um, uh, uh, in, in the display manager. If you don't, if, and and that, that's the case with new Wayland and new frame buffers. So the kernel uh, already runs at a, um, at, a, at a reasonable display resolution, so we don't have to, uh, we don't have to do this uh, for, uh, for a proper login. So 
uh, also uh, there are things in, in the Linux world. So why do I have to become an expert to get a GNU PG key layout? I mean, this is an application thing, but re reasonably, why, why do I have to be an expert to get an authentication key? So um, I would like to make a fresh start uh, by creating a small but functional base system that actually boots up uh, without taking resources from slash USR, like uh, most like the, the uh, FreeBSD um, things are doing, adding an AppArmor profile, add a package manager uh, that can be used to install apps, create a quick and dirty installer, push the thing on a separate uh, GitLab instance for bug tracking and building, and um, yeah, uh, I would like to discuss uh, those ideas um, with you, uh, so let us meet at uh, 11.30 today in lecture room M1. And uh, you see, uh, I have a few bugs in, the, in my slides. Um, I also have a, um, a, I've created a, an improved uh, matrix channel, a 35C3 Linux improved, uh, where you can meet me. Uh, there will be an email address, linuximproved at fnordpol.de, where you can contact me and you can meet me at the MetaLab in Vienna if you want to discuss uh, details. And uh, I think that's it. Thank you. Next up is navigating in Linux kernel security area. Hello, um, my name is Alexander Popov. I'm the Linux kernel developer and security researcher, and I want to tell you about navigating in the Linux kernel security area. Um, uh, Linux kernel security is a very complex area. There are uh, various uh, key concepts there. Uh, there are vulnerability classes, exploitation techniques, uh, bug detection means, and various defenses. Some of them are in the Linux kernel mainline. Some of them are still out of tree. Some of them are commercial. Some def uh, defensive technologies need uh, special hardware uh, to work. And all these um, items have complex, complex relations between each other. And it would, really, it would be really great to have some graphical representation to navigate for easier navigation in the documentation. So I created such a map. It is available at the GitHub. It operates the key concepts which I already um, described. And the connection between nodes uh, represents some kind of relation. Uh, this map is um, about the Linux kernel uh, self-protection. It is not about cutting attack surface. So this is a map. It is very complex. You, I guess you can't see anything. Uh, uh, but I want to show uh, some part of it. So there are, um, those are vulner vulnerability classes, stack depth overflow, uninitialized variables, uh, usage information exposure. Uh, they have CWE, common weakness enumeration numbers for uh, easier search. And there is a PEX memory stack leak feature from JAR security which provides some mitigations against those kinds of attacks, uh, against those kinds, kinds of vulnerabilities. And there is a stack leak port, which I prepared for the Linux kernel mainline. It is, in, it is merged into kernel 4.20. And there is a KMSN uh, debugging uh, mechanism. It is not for protecting you um, in production, it is for debugging, and we can combine such technologies, uh, enable them, and fuzz the kernel to find the bugs and zero days. And I really hope you are interested, and um, I encourage you to experiment with your kernel and um, read those information uh, sources. There are there is a really nice list of jar security features. Uh, there is a Linux kernel security documentation in the main line, which is a really nice document describing the whole picture of Linux kernel security. 
uh, which uh, tasks do we have, which goals we need to achieve. Uh, there is a list of recommending, recommended kernel settings from kernel self-protection project, um, which can, if you enable them, your kernel uh, can be more secure. And there is a mitigation checklist uh, which shows the current progress uh, in upstreaming jar security features into Linux kernel mainline and uh, to Android open source project uh, um, then. And um, it is really uh, not very funny to um, search in your config file for the hardening options, enabling them, and so on. So let's computers do their job. And I created a script which can check your uh, kernel config file against the uh, hardening recommendations. And uh, you can uh, just run it with your config file, see the recommendations, and, if, uh, and then uh, go to the map and uh, see w where in the documentation you should read about this particular feature. Uh, so thanks for your attention. Uh, you can catch me uh, here at the Congress. You can write me emails. Linux kernel developers really like plain text emails. And the main point, enjoy the Congress. Thank you. Now next up is pass the cookie and pivot to the cloud. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Johan. Uh, I'm a security engineer and professional penetration tester. And today I want to talk about pass the cookie, which is an attack technique uh, that I've been using for a long time. And I want to kind of share it. It's not really totally novel, but I think we need to talk more about this to protect infrastructure better. Uh, so what are cookies? I think we don't have to talk about that much. Everybody knows about cookies. They're used for security, for authentication, and establishing a session between a client and a web server. And it usually is a single key to the kingdom, which means if you steal the cookie, uh, then you get access to the web application. Uh, there was a lot of talk about four or five years ago with Firesheep that was really, really good, right, where we kind of, the entire industry stepped up and we kind of deployed SSL much more widely, which is very, very good, and everybody should use that. But what I want to talk about now is sort of other techniques somebody might deploy or leverage to steal your authentication cookies. Uh, so think about it. A cookie might be the single key. Who, who here uses AWS or Microsoft Azure? Uh, a cookie might be the single key to your entire data, virtual data center. So if you have like a data center a building, you imagine, right, the cookie is the key to that building. Uh, or personally, if you have cryptocurrency, your finances, right, or Facebook, the cookie might be the authentication co uh, token to get an attacker in. Um, so what is pass the cookie? Uh, so if you can tell, it's very much similar if you're familiar with pass the hash. Right? It's the same concept. You have the token, you pass it, and you pivot through the environment. Uh, so an attacker might be after valuable assets, valuable hosts in your infrastructure where there might be powerful cookies available. Uh, uh, and as I said, I've used this many, many times during adversarial emulation uh, to achieve mission objective. So how can you kind of gather the, the cookie in the first place? So pass the cookie is sort of a post-exploitation technique, which means uh, the host that we talk about is already compromised. So imagine a uh, phishing attack. There's a chat established in the organization and the company, that, uh, and then the adversary starts pivoting through the environment, right? They maybe even compromise the domain controller. So at that point, they have full uh, capabilities within the company. But they still have not pivoted to what I call the pivot to the cloud. Uh, so now you can go find an administrator of the subscription or the AWS account, compromise that machine, and then they can pass the cookie. They steal the cookie using some of these techniques here, uh, and then they pass the cookie to pivot uh, to the cloud infrastructure. Uh, the one thing I want to point out here is process dump, which is sort of a very, very simple tool. But cookies are not just stored in process, uh, processes of browsers, right? Or on the disk from a browser perspective. Cookies, you can also find them in other applications that do authentication. So somebody might use process dump to kind of dump all the processes in the machine and look for cookies. 
Uh, so yeah, and then how do you pass the cookie? In the past, like four or five years ago, right, you had to install some extensions and so on. Now it's really simple. You use the developer console. You just go in the console and set the cookie. Or there's even UI. Like Chrome has a nice UI to set the cookie. Uh, yeah, I want to point out cookie crimes, which I just, I, right now I work uh, at a place where we have a lot of Macs. So I had to look for techniques on how to do this on a Mac. And there's great research done. Uh, and there's something called cookie crimes that uses headless Chrome to allow you to steal the cookies. Uh, so here's a simple example how you might compromise GitHub, right? You go to the GitHub web page, refresh, there's no cookies, you're not authenticated. There's a single cookie called user session, you paste it in, refresh the page, and you're logged in. Uh, and now let's move this to the cloud. This is sort of really what I want to kind of highlight. Is uh, your organization might have, or Google Cloud Compute, for instance, another, like one of the three big cloud infrastructure providers, Right, an adversary might have stolen, compromised the administrator, and then uh, they steal a cookie and pivot into the cloud. So sort of a three-step process. Sort of part of my own like, work, I started building out this cheat sheet for myself. So I, I thought I'd share that which kind of cookies you might be interested in, depending on the client you work with. And always make sure that you have authorization for any of this kind of work. Right, That's sort of something I've put it in the very beginning as well. Uh, so here you can see a sample of interesting web pages and the cookies that you can steal or that somebody might steal, an adversary might steal to authenticate and simulate a breach. Uh, talking about detections, right? Uh, there's things that we kind of have to do is like monitor for process dumps, monitor for access anomalies, uh, uh, monitor for unusual activity on websites. Uh, and then I want to move forward and talk about mitigations also, right? Uh, deleting cookies on the machine regularly is very important. Delete the session cookies, right? If you, uh, and this is one thing I want to highlight, right? If you are not the only administrator on your machine, it is not your machine. Anything on, is, on it belongs to everybody else or any other administrator on the machine also, right? That is very, very important, especially if you work in a company. Never use your company Four, laptop three, to uh, two, perform one. work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Next up is more on drugs. <laughs> um, uh, hello. Uh, the full title of the talk is War on Drugs and doing 50 years of fake news and propaganda. Uh, you need to decide for yourself what do you want to do? What is your core set of values? And me personally, I am pro choice, freedom, and education. Uh, there are many different uh, scientific research. This is about the fat, the fat and sugar, the sugar industry blamed fat. You eat fat, you become fat, but this is not true. You need to provide fat to your body because it's a part of a healthy, balanced diet. This is the cigarette advertisement from 50 years ago. <laughs> yeah, of course, your doctor smoked camels. Uh, the Marlboro guy who was advertising cigarettes, he died of, uh, from lung cancer. And this is probably one of the most important quotes that 50 years ago, uh, the Nixon presidential election, and basically you cannot make illegal to be against war. So what they did to keep the war in Vietnam going, they criminalized drugs. The war on drugs is a direct consequence of war in Vietnam. They couldn't keep up with the peace movements, so they had to find a way to put them into prison. And then we have a private prison system. The moment you make money from putting people into prison, uh, you, just in, you are incentivized to keep the system going. And this is basically a, a vicious circle. It is a complete bullshit. And I encourage you to just uh, think, uh, follow the money. If you do not know what's going on, just follow the money. 
And all these pervert incentives create a situation when uh, judges are bribed by the prison system to put children into jail. However, now we have a little change in the law because of the internet. Internet allows us to communicate freely. This is the uh, legal map of cannabis in the US. In uh, many states, cannabis is uh, legal or legal for medicinal purposes. It is changing rapidly. Uh, the human perception is also changing. In the United Kingdom, the medical cannabis was legalized 1st of November. In Mexico, it is also changing. In South Africa, it is changing. It is pretty much becoming legal. So this is just the cannabis. Um, Okay, this is about the business model of pharmaceutical industry. They get money if you are hooked on their legal drugs, and they don't have incentives to use the drugs that are actually helping people. This is the ketamine that is testing for depression, MDMA for PTSD, uh, psilocybin for people who have uh, terminal diseases, and they know they will die, but using a psychedelic such as psilocybin, allows them to become more okay with death. Like, okay, I'm dying, but this is only my body, my soul will survive. So it is, they are reducing their anxiety. And this is like a second level of research that we, we already know that psilocybin is effective. So now we are testing which type of music for this type of treatment. So this playlist is amazing, I highly recommend it books about the DMT. Uh, this, is a, this is a metaphor, that uh, we have the telescope to look into the stars, we have the microscope to look into a very, very small object, but we are still looking for the micro, uh, microscope for the brain. So here it is an example of a scientific research of scanning the brain, um, various connections in the brain. Here is the wiki with a self-medication, psychedelic retreats, and this is probably, uh, if you want to stay connected, psychedelic.community, you can meet with like-minded people, you can learn more, and always do your own research. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Now, the next talk is not going to be a talk, but rather an experiment and one of the rare occasions where we surrender our hardware to someone else. Um, this is the last uh, event in this session, so if you're not comfortable with any of this, you can just leave without missing out on anything. Uh, I don't know, I just, I, I just go away and let them do their work.
right, thanks. So, big round of applause for these guys. And uh, that's the end of our session today. Thank you for being here. Thanks to all the speakers who participated. And a big round of applause for everybody who stood on the stage here. Also a big round of applause for the translation team who did an awesome job translating the lightning talks. <laughs>